Welcome back to the Cineposium podcast, and thank you for joining us for our first episode of our fourth season. We have some exciting plans for this season, and we're delighted to be back to present more virtual programming and film analysis on the show. Every week, we invite members or collaborators of Cineposium to curate a film for remote viewing. Then we get together on this podcast, and we have a conversation about the film. In our first episode of the season, Reed Williams and guest Stephen Farber discuss Francois Truffaut's 1962 picture, Jules and Jim. Enjoy the conversation. Hello, everyone. I'm pleased today that uh, film critic and author Stephen Farber is joining us for the podcast. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Good to be with you all. Now, Stephen's written criticism for such esteemed publications as the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Hollywood Reporter, Premier Magazine, Film Comment, and many others. He also served as the president of the Los Angeles Film Critics Association. Prior to the pandemic, Stephen hosted the Real Talk film preview series in partnership with Landmark Theaters and the Repertory Anniversary Classic Series at Lamely. Through his work as a critic and moderator, he's interviewed many of the top actors, writers, directors, and producers. Uh, Stephen's passionate about sharing classic films with his students when he teaches his film criticism class and 60s cinema class at the UCLA School for Theater and Television. Um, Now, speaking of the 60s, last year, Stephen wrote and published a book with his writing partner, Michael McClellan, titled Cinema 62, The Greatest Year at the Movies where they argue that 1962 was indeed the greatest year for film. A somewhat provocative claim given that 1939, 1976, and even 1999 have been called the greatest film years. Uh, So today, in honor of Stephen's book, uh, we're going to be discussing one of the films uh, from that book, Francois Truffaut's Jules and Jim. Uh, But before we get into the film, Stephen, Would you mind just talking a little bit more about the book and why you and Michael think that 1962 is the high watermark for cinema? Well, you know, I think a lot of people have uh, favorite years of movies. We have found that, uh, you know, just in in being interviewed by people and talking with people, there's a lot of, and often it coincides with sort of a year of, adolescent uh, discovery or teenage discovery when you're kind of uh, first falling under the spell of movies. I was always like a a movie lover, even as a child. But uh, when I was a freshman in college, that was 62. And so it was a, a year of major discovery of foreign films as well as uh, uh, American movies and just a tremendous, I mean, I didn't think about it at the time that uh, this was the greatest year, but then as time passed and I saw other movies and revisited the movies from 1962, I began to realize that this was pretty, a remarkable collection of movies that have stood the test of time. And we've gotten very good press for the book from a number of different uh, publications, online forums and all, who not everybody agrees, but a number of people do agree and said, oh yes, I mean, 62, you know, you can come up with like 50 first rate movies and how many years could you really say that about? Uh, And, you know, recently uh, some uh, like a younger critic put 1999 as uh, his favorite year. And you you can come up with some interesting movies there too. there was just another book published last year called uh, 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 The Big Goodbye about Chinatown, the making of Chinatown and the people who came together. And that author sort of argues that 1974, the year of Chinatown was the greatest year. 
and 1939, as you mentioned, had been revered for a long time as the greatest year. But I think you would be hard pressed to come up with any of these years that have like 50 approximately top films that are really still worth watching and, and re-watching. One thing that made 1962 different from 1939 is the explosion of foreign cinema that took place in the late 1950s, early 1960s. That didn't exist in 1939 at all. I mean, very, maybe a, a few foreign films that were seen, mainly French films, I think, but that had changed. I mean, 39 was a great year for the Hollywood studio picture. But 62, the studios were still active, but there was such a new movement of partly independent financing, which was just getting started in 62. But the foreign film boom was really going very strong in 1962. And I think that distinguished it from these earlier years. And I think it also was distinguished from current years that did not have and do not have as many, there may be good foreign films, but not as many that are widely seen by filmmakers who are revered the world over. In 62, you had all the major uh, leaders in the foreign film renaissance, uh, Fellini, Antonioni, uh, De Sica, Bunuel, Kurosawa, Truffaut, Antonioni, um, Agnes Barda, a French uh, a female filmmaker, but uh, directors from all over the world, Ingmar Bergman. So you really had such a range of movies that were being exposed to American audiences uh, at that time. And so uh, Jules and Jim is a good movie to talk about because it epitomizes uh, this explosion of foreign cinema and the impact that it had on uh, moviegoers in the US as well as in other countries of the world. So I think that's one of the things that distinguished 62 from earlier years like 1939, 1940, 1941. They also have their champions, by the way, those other years that you know were some very good films too. 41 is the year of Citizen Kane um, and some other important movies. But, uh, but I think it's not only that. I mean, a lot of great American movies were made in 62 as well. So you had, uh, and, and when you mentioned to people what some of these movies were, a lot of people say, oh, I didn't realize that all those movies came out in the same year. And, you know, major uh, American or, or British filmmakers, in addition to the foreign filmmakers that I mentioned, but uh, a lot of the other people, the American masters, like John Huston and John Ford and Howard Hawks, and some younger American directors like uh, Sidney Lumet and John Frankenheimer, Stanley Kubrick, Sam Peckinpah. It was a, a quite a range of impressive movies coming along in one year. And I think, as I say, I'm not sure that people really recognize it at the time. Sometimes it requires some passage of time and some historical perspective to see what a special and distinctive year it was for the art of cinema. Now that I think about it, and now that you bring it up, a lot of those sort of arguments for other movie years, uh, they are very Hollywood centric. I mean, I guess right. the 70s obviously is, you have the new Hollywood movement, um, but, but then you do have to think that it, it does, uh, it seems like a lot of the directors from that movement were very influenced, like you said, by, uh, the filmmakers from the 60s, you know, particularly Truffaut and the French New Wave and uh, Fellini. So right. um, 
So I like that your book focuses not only on Hollywood, but on um, international films as well, which, yeah, like you said, does lead us perfectly to uh, the film we're going to discuss today, which is uh, Jules and Jim, um, directed by Francois Truffaut, who uh, previously uh, was a film critic right. um, and then moved into to directing. So I I'm curious, Stephen, what would you say just like your quick overview of the plot? How would you describe uh, Jules and Jim? Well, it's a, a story about three people, really. Two men, uh, uh, Jules and Jim, who become friends, meet in uh, uh, Paris shortly before the First World War broke out and are both interested in books and art, intellectuals, um, and they meet this free-spirited woman, Catherine, and both become very enchanted with her. The film covers about a 20-year uh, period, really, and the friends are first separated by the First World War, where they fight on opposite sides, and then they're reunited after the war in uh, Germany, where Jules uh, the German friend has married Catherine, um, but there's some cracks in their marriage and uh, Jim uh, comes to visit and he was always in love with her as well and they begin an affair. And so it's the interactions among these three people primarily leading to a tragic conclusion where Catherine kills herself and uh, uh, Jim, leaving Jules as the only survivor. So a film that begins in the exhilarating rush of friendship, love, art, literature, ends on a tragic note as the world is moving toward the Second World War. And one of the last scenes in the movie is when the characters are in a movie theater watching a newsreel of the book burnings in uh, a Nazi Germany. And so that's a dark note of where the world is heading at that time after the flush of excitement when they first met. And so the deaths of the two main characters are also uh, anticipating a much larger tragedy that's going to engulf the world in the years to come. So that's the basic plot. I mean, it's not, uh, uh, these foreign films didn't have uh, intricate plots like Hollywood uh, thrillers, but uh, that's basically what happens. And I was looking at the movie again, and I realized that, of course, people may not think about this now, because we've become a little more jaded and we're, we've seen a lot more sexually explicit films than Jules and Jim, but it was a very unusual film for 1962 in the sense of being about kind of a, a menage a trois where the two men are sharing the, the same women, a woman, and they're all, they both love her, she loves both of them. And this was somewhat shocking to audiences in 62. You didn't see these kinds of stories. I mean, it's, it's not graphic sexually at all, but it's very frank about what's going on in this sort of uh, three-way relationship, uh, enough that it was condemned by the Catholic Legion of Decency which was like a morals uh, 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 censorship group that had a great deal of influence at that time in the 60s. And they felt this movie was completely immoral in kind of uh, just depicting this kind of a three-way uh, romance and uh, and I think what may have been especially shocking was that the character of Jules, who, who's married to Catherine, 
encourages his friend to sleep with Catherine and have a love affair with her and even possibly have children with her, which they don't end up having, but and that they would all continue to be a part of each other's lives. So, I mean, there was a, that kind of generosity, tolerance, a, a sign of their true friendship that uh, Jules did not feel this kind of jealousy or possessiveness that a lot of people would feel, but it was really kind of uh, his just openness to experimenting with new ways of male-female relationships. So, I mean, you may not feel it if you're watching it for, for the first time now, but it was shocking at the time that the movie was made. And Truffaut himself said that, yes, this is, would seem like a, a salacious subject to deal with, he said, but I, I, I think it's a very moral film because he didn't say that specifically that they were punished for their actions, but that he said it certainly didn't end, didn't have a happy ending. It had a, a very melancholy conclusion in terms of the consequences of trying to live this unconventional, uh, romantic and sexual life. Um, so you you might think that, you know, because of the Hollywood uh, production code, they didn't forbid um, extramarital affairs from being presented, because that's always been a part of drama and a part of life. But they, of course, insisted that there would be a punishment in the scripts and the films if anybody transgressed in this way. And in a sense, there is a punishment in uh, uh, Jules and Jim, but I don't think it comes across as uh, like a moralistic ending, but it, it's certainly a very melancholy ending as Truffaut said. And I don't think it's because of their sexual unconventionality that this happened, but it was just because of the complexity of the characters and uh, the challenges of trying to live an unconventional life as these three characters were trying to do. Yeah, you know, I, I wasn't aware that, uh, like you mentioned, the Legion of Decency came out against the film. And, uh, you know, like you said, it is a little funny today because there, there aren't any like explicit sex right. acts like right. shown on screen. Um, but, uh, you know, all the characters, and especially Catherine, are very open about uh, their sexual desire. Right. And, uh, you know, as we've seen, you know, in America, if, with the MPA's guidelines, and just throughout kind of film history, that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not okay for, for female characters to have sexual desire. And, and like you said, they're often punished if they do. Yes. Um, but I agree with you that the ending doesn't feel, well, and especially after you connected it to um, the emergence of Hitler and the coming of World War II, uh, that especially um, kind of convinces me that it's not a moralistic ending. Like, uh, I'll admit that the ending is definitely a, a bit of a puzzle. You, you know, I've, I'm still wrapping my mind around it, even after seeing the film twice, but you know, just uh, seeing that archival footage of the book burning and then pretty much immediately is where that sort of tragic ending happens. Yes. So, so it is interesting to think of their relationship and their friendship in sort of geopolitical terms as well as, as interpersonal terms as well. But you raise a good point about the, the female character and, um, you know, she was a, a, a Catherine was a controversial character even at the time, especially to um, male critics who dominated the critical establishment um, because she really didn't abide by the rules or the traditional female roles. She wasn't gonna be limited to like a marital uh, a relationship only not only did she have an affair with her husband's 
best friend, but she has other affairs we're told about. We see one of them, uh, but the, there have been other men and she talks about this. So yes, this is like, like the new woman of the early 20th century who was not going to be bound by the morals that placed women into a very narrow niche in the past. She was going to make her own rules and live the way that a man does in terms of following her desires wherever they might lead. Not that she's presented in a, uh, in a glorified way, because near the end of the film, Jim says to her, uh, you want it to be a, a pioneer basically in terms of free love and unconventional romances. He, but he says, but you, but pioneers need to be unselfish. And uh, she certainly is not unselfish, but she was a very threatening figure, I say to a lot of male critics at the time. Now the major female critic of that era, Pauline Kael, who had a lot of influence. This was before she had a regular outlet, but she was writing reviews and doing like broadcasting her reviews on, on a radio station. And she loved Jules and Jim. And she thought the character of Catherine as a woman, she responded to just the audacity of Catherine, recognizing that she was not a perfect person. She's hardly like a paragon of virtue but she was strong-willed, independent, you know, had an appetite for life and experience that was very appealing to uh, uh, this woman critic. And I mean, so it was like the male critics who were so threatened by the character of Catherine, I think, because it undercut the whole idea of uh, male dominance in, in uh, uh, a romantic relationships. And, showed that that didn't have to be the case, that uh, uh, like the woman character could take charge and set the rules and kind of force the men to go along with her. And they have a hard time with it at times, but they, they do because of their love for her. And very interesting, innovative, complex character, not She's not a, like a glorified character. You can certainly have valid criticisms of her, but uh, Jean Moreau is such a superb actress that you're always uh, drawn to her and caught up with her, even if you don't always approve of her. You're, you're not meant to approve of her all the time, I, I think. Yeah, you know, one of the kind of standout moments with her that I think of uh, is when um, they're all, oh, she interrupts the game of dominoes between Jules and Jim. And she starts talking about how like, before I met you two, I never laughed. And I always looked like this. <laughs> and she makes a sad face and then Truffaut right, like right. freeze frames that face. And then, you know, she makes other facial expressions and, um, you know, that, and it's a testament to her acting as well as uh, Truffaut's uh, right. filmmaking prowess, I think. Um, so, uh, and, and it, you know, just another note ab about that, I, I happened to watch just like one of the little uh, right. supplemental features that had Truffaut being interviewed about the film. And he mentioned that that was, that specific moment is kind of a joke about her other roles. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not super familiar with her filmography, but I guess she uh, she mainly up to that point had played yeah. very serious, very dramatic kind of dour roles. So, I, you know, I love uh, that this role gave her some complex kind of material to chew on and, uh, you know, highlighted kind of her comedic yes. and uh, other sort of abilities. Um, but, you know, just to those freeze frames, I think that's that's another thing we kind of spoke about uh, before the recording is just, uh, you know, the filmmaking in general and um, Truffaut's technique as a filmmaker. Uh, and I think those are really good moments. I think just 
the entire first act for me is is really hooked me just because of like how yeah. playful and, and as you said uh inventive the the filmmaking is so i'm curious just to hear some of like your the moments that stick out in your mind that exemplify uh, well this. i mean this is i mean you feel in this movie it was Truffaut's third feature but you really feel his joy in the process of filmmaking here just he revels in the freedom that he has with technique to do as you said he has the freeze frames at times he very quick cutting which was typical of the french new wave and was kind of a novelty at that time and just the beautiful cinematography of Raoul Coutard. I mean, just uh, stunning images. Some of these images, um, when they moved to Germany and the forests and the lakes and, uh, and just the rapid fire cutting, which at the first part of the movie gives you a sense of exhilaration that these characters are discovering. First of all, and I should say this is a slightly different point, but just their their love of the literature and ideas. That's how Jules and Jim first uh, connect. They find oh, intellectually they have so much in common, and they're talking about books and plays and politics and ideas and just their enthusiasm about all of that. And I think the technique is really meant to approximate this mood of experimentation and uh, kind of a bohemian feel that you had in the early part of the uh, uh, 20th century. So, I mean, it technically, it's full of exhilaration. I love the early sequence where they go to the seashore for a little holiday and they share a house and they're just enjoying exploring and finding objects on the ground and uh, just, uh, yes, with their laughter and playfulness and uh, the love of nature, going to the sea, going through the forest. It's all part of the adventure of uh, youthful discovery and, and romance and you're meant to be swept up in that exhilaration. And then of course the mood changes as the film, we move into the First World War and the aftermath of that. And by that point, Jules and Catherine have, have a daughter and uh, their relationships become more tortured somewhat. So it's a, a different feeling. It's not the same kind of playfulness and exhilaration, although there are certainly moments like that when the, like in the later part where the four of them, including uh, the daughter are sitting around a, a table making faces. And uh, so the playfulness uh, continues, but it's also enhanced and bolstered with other moods as well. That's the to me, the great thing about the movie is it encompasses so many different moods. I mean, some people may feel a little let down after that first third, which I say is so full of energy and exhilaration, but it means to suggest the complexity of life as people mature. One other issue of it that sort of begins, and this is an interesting element of the movie, is the uh, use of voice over narration. How did you feel about that? I, I'll tell you what I feel about it, but I, I'm just interested. We can have a little exchange, I guess, about that uh, aspect of the movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, that is, you know, voice over narration is definitely like, a, I think your mileage varies depending on who you are. Uh, I know some critics and audiences have like very little patience with it. But I think um, in this instance, it's it's well used and I can see its fingerprint on like, I guess like Martin Scorsese, like the way he uses uh, like freeze frame and narration uh, to tell a story. So 
so I think in this particular case, I, I thought it was effective. And, uh, um, and I think it, it does also speak to, um, you know, in that same supplemental kind of interview with Truffaut, he mentioned that what he was trying to go for uh, with this film um, was a different kind of adaptation. I'm not sure if we mentioned, but the, uh, Jules and Jim is based on a, a, a novel uh, of the same name. Um, and, you know, he said, instead of just simply like taking the book and turning it into kind of a stage play adaptation almost, he really wanted to do kind of like what he called a filmed reading where you would have like a scene play out like you would in a film, but then have narrative moments like um, uh, narration, for example, come in to speak to the, the novelistic uh, part of the film. Um, so yeah, I'm curious to hear your th thoughts on it. Yes, I mean, I think a part of it, that's a good point that you mentioned, the uh, a novel, because I think part of the reason for doing the, the voiceover was to pay tribute to the author uh, of the book. I mean, Truffaut really admired the author and uh, wanted to honor him by keeping some of his prose description in the movie. I, it's interesting, am not often a fan of uh, a voiceover narration. This is one of the few examples in film where I think it really enhances the movie. It's, because um, a lot of times it's used purely for exposition and uh, people, filmmakers who couldn't find a, a more efficient way to uh, uh, dramatize use this as a crutch of voiceover narration to explain. Here, it's not really explaining things for the most part. It partly, I think it's reflecting, as I mentioned before, the uh, a literary nature of these characters and their interests in literature and their love of literature, reading, writing. And so that's a part of what's so important to them and the, the voiceover narration reflects that very much. And it gives you the sense of that these are intellectuals, that they're reflecting on things. They're not just acting and reacting. That's who these characters are. They're so immersed in literature and ideas that it makes sense that their story is partly told through a very literate narration. It, it's very much, in keeping with what makes these characters at this particular moment in history so interesting and exciting company to be with because they had such a love of ideas and a, a kind of literacy that that's reflected in uh, the narration of the movie. And I never felt that it stopped the action in any way because the movie still has a tremendous forward thrust and momentum. It's not like some movies, they stop when a, 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 a character or a narrator gives you this voiceover reporting on what happened. This movie never stops. I mean, it never kind of sits still. It's moving vigorously throughout its, uh, it's only an hour and 45 minutes or so, and yet it covers so much ground. And I think uh, the narration is one of the tools that helps uh, to add to the depth of the material. And sometimes it tells us things that we would, it would take much longer to dramatize, like when, um, Jim and Catherine are hoping to have a child uh, and that fails. And you could have done that without the narration, but I think at that point in the movie, you want it to keep moving. And I think that enables it to move still at a good clip. And uh, even during those more uh, a melancholy, moments, but important to the story. Yeah, that same kind of moment of the narration summarizing Jim and Catherine's uh, attempts to have a baby 
came to my mind too when you said that really the narration doesn't stop the action but actually really helps uh condense some things that might have you know eaten up the the running time of the film you know we we did speak a little bit about uh Catherine's character and her relationship with the two uh male protagonists um and you know we've we've definitely talked about it just throughout but I'm also curious um just to discuss Jules and Jim's relationship too um you know there's a lot of emphasis about friendship and platonic love. I, I think at the end, after Jim dies, it says something like their friendship and love was like, you know, they, they described it in really kind of superlative uh, yeah. terms. So, um, you know, that's definitely a big part of the film too. And, and I think I noticed this time around just with the trio itself, um, you know, not only are Jules and Jim kind of jealous of each other's kind of dalliances with Catherine, but Cat Catherine's also really jealous of, of their friendship and, yes. and love for each yes. other as well. Um, so, you, you know, I, and I guess immediately kind of one of my personal favorite genres is like the buddy movie or the buddy comedy. And I think, you know, this film really does sort of have that format in the first act. Like you said, it becomes more complex and has some darker uh right. tones in in the second and third but you know for the first act it's just them like hanging out in Paris and having a great time and right. so you know I'm curious like I could definitely see this film's influence on like which Cassidy and the Sundance Kid with like the friendship between the outlaws and their kind of love triangle with um uh Etta um, yeah. But I'm I'm curious to hear just your thoughts on on sort of the buddy aspect of the film and and maybe just what other sort of buddy films or films that Jules and Jim you think may have influenced or, or remind you of. Well, I think that um, this is a little different from some of those because some of these, um, you know, there've been a lot of uh, Hollywood buddy movies, often. They're like caper movies where people are planning a crime, or Ed Butch Cassidy is a little of that. They're, you know, um, train robbers, bank robbers, whatever. But um, this was a friendship uh, intellectual uh, basis that it had. They really come together because of their love of books and art and share that so intensely. And in fact, the scene where they go to the theater and Jules and Jim uh, have, uh, they have an argument with Catherine, but you know, they agree very much about the play that they've seen, they didn't like it. And she tries to defend it and she feels excluded from their kind of intellectual camaraderie at that point. And that's why she jumps into the sand, which is kind of a preview of what the ending of the film is gonna be when she drives her car in, into uh, of a, I don't know if it's a lake, I guess. Um, so she is threatened by their intellectual closeness and companionship. And as you say, the one of the very last lines in the film was that their love, as the narrator says, their love had no counterpart in the world of uh, heterosexual romance, uh, that there was just this ongoing love and friendship but I do think it's a little different from most of like the buddy movies that you would see, which didn't have that intellectual uh, dimension to it. It's uh, they are brought together because they like to discuss books and uh, that's something in Hollywood movies you don't usually see. I mean, it's really an intellectual companionship and camaraderie. And then it spills over into romance and sexual affairs as well as often happens with friends. But it starts on a very much an intellectual level. And also I would say maybe a spiritual level. They are really soulmates in the sense that they care so much about each other 
and when they have to fight on opposite sides of the First World War, each of them is like terrified at the idea that they might inadvertently kill the other in a battle. So, I mean, they are so totally devoted to each other. And I don't know if some other film, like American movies would be worried that this might seem a little homoerotic to have this kind of spiritual and intellectual closeness, but Truffaut didn't worry about uh, things like that. He just wanted to honor a very profound friendship between these men and goes to the, it's such a generosity that Jules is willing to give his wife to this man. Uh, partly it's a way of keeping Catherine so that she won't abandon the family, but it's also because I don't think he would do this so happily with other men that he knows, but because of his tremendous uh, friendship and love for Jim. So that it's a very much, uh, this is like the, the quintessential uh, male buddy friendship movie, because I think it's on a, so much uh, a deeper level than most of the movies about male friendship, which is more usually kind of bantering with each other, or as I said, planning like a heist or a robbery. Uh, that's often what it's about, but uh, this uh, was on a whole different level of commitment, I think. And those are great points. And, and you know, you bring up them fighting in the First World War. And, you know, I think even Jules says at one point, like, I have to go to Russia now. And I'm, it's going to be tough, but I prefer it because I know I won't yes. be a, at risk to, to kill Jim. Um, and, and, you know, speaking at the beginning of our conversation about um, how the book burning sort of foreshadows uh, Catherine and Jim's death. Um, so it, it does, you know, I think there's a little there's another layer of their friendship, which is just uh, how it symbolically represents that, you know, friendship doesn't have, has no borders and no politics. You know, you yeah. could be from different countries and be fighting on different sides. And um, still you can, I think the film communicates beautifully that you can maintain those friendships if they are uh, strong enough. So right. yeah, yeah, well said. And one of the first things in the movie is when they first meet and they talk about they want to translate each other's books, <laughs> you know, that they're, you know, both writers in a sense. I mean, Jim, I think, is more of a published writer than Jules, but Jules becomes a writer, too, of certain kind of scientific uh, books, but that they they want their each other's ideas to be communicated in their own language and translated to the other language. So, I mean, that again, it's it's just indicative of the, their devotion to each other and to their love of literature and ideas. Definitely. And, you know, I, I feel like there's still so much more we could talk about this film. Um, uh, it was good to, to revisit it and to, um, you know, discuss it. Uh, any any other sort of last uh, topics or last things you, you'd like to mention before we call it? I would just say that, um, you know, I wasn't really planning to watch the film again. I've seen it a number of times, but, you know, I have the Criterion channel. So I decided, oh, I'll take a look at it, you know, watch part of it. And I ended up watching the whole movie again there. Uh, and so it just, the ending is so beautiful and moving, uh, sad, the loss of these two people, but it also affirms how devoted to each other they were and how unconventional their lives and loves were. And I mean, the last line of the movie, I think is uh, the narration said that um, 
He wanted to scatter their ashes, uh, but it was not permitted. And that's just sort of summed up what these characters were like, that they were very much anti-establishment, free spirits, believing in the primacy of ideas and uh, love rather than uh, regulations of society. And I should also say that the, the, that last sad scene in the uh, a cemetery uh, is accompanied by the music, the song that uh, Jean Moreau sings uh, in the earlier scene where she's written this song with her friend, the uh, guitarist. And it's really a song about the impermanence of life and how things change and evolve, but people somehow through all of that keep getting back together. So it's, it stirs an echo of that earlier scene where she talks about the, the whirlpool of days. You, you separate, you come together. That's what the whole film is about uh, uh, with these three characters. And the ending reminds you of that. And let's not underestimate the importance of, of the musical score of this film. It's one of the great scores, I think, in movies anywhere in the world. Uh, Georges Delarue was a new composer at the time who went on to have a great career all over the world, not just in French cinema, although he wrote the music for Truffaut's early films and then became a Hollywood composer also. But it just reminds you like the collaborative nature of, of film because there's so many different people who contributed to this movie the composer, the cinematographer, the editor, the actors, as well as the uh, uh, filmmaker, Truffaut. And it's a film that's sort of about comradeship and collaboration and selfless friendship and love. So it seems appropriate that uh, there's a, a group of filmmakers contributing to the impact of the movie. Yeah, I've had that that theme from the score kind of running in a loop in my mind <laughs> since I watched the film. So right. it is a, a wonderful score. And uh, like you said, there's so many other great collaborators that really helped Truffaut achieve uh, uh, the vision yeah. of this film. So um, yeah, thank you so much, Stephen, for joining us. Uh, everyone, uh, check out Stephen and Michael's book, Cinema 62, and then once we can all start going back to theaters, try and make a, a real talk screening or an anniversary classic, I'm, I'm definitely hoping to, to join you at those as soon as uh, yes. we can. Very good. Well, thank you. Yeah, I hope we can all see each other in person before too much longer. And uh, yeah, I mean, I enjoyed this conversation. And please let me know or when other people are going to be um, discussing or contributing or what people have to say about it. I'll be interested to find out more. You bet. That's it for our show this week. Thank you for listening and for your support. Please subscribe to the show on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow us on Instagram at Cineposium and on Twitter at Cposium to keep up with our updates and to keep in communication with us. Until next week, take care everyone.